How did artists use the most expensive pigment? The Wilton diptych is over 600 years old and was made for a king of England. We know that gold is associated with wealth and high status, but today we're going to look at the intense and beautiful blue colour used mainly in the right-hand panel. The blue pigment used here is also a precious material, which has sometimes been even more expensive than gold. So what is the pigment we're looking at, and what makes it so special? This vivid blue pigment is natural ultramarine. Natural ultramarine was highly prized due to its strong colour and for its durability compared to some other blue pigments. It came to be associated with luxury because it was made from a rare type of mineral. So where did the natural ultramarine come from? The name ultramarine translates as beyond the sea. This refers to the fact that it is made from a mineral that had to be imported along the Silk Road to Europe from Badakhshan in present-day Afghanistan, one of the very few places in the world where it naturally occurs. It was expensive not only because of the difficulty of getting hold of this mineral, but also because it needs careful processing to purify it and produce the best blue colour. So how was ultramarine pigment made? Natural ultramarine pigment is made from the mineral lapis lazuli, a semi-precious stone that's also used for jewellery. If you look closely at the stone, you can see that the bright blue colour is not uniform. It has streaks of white within it, and also tiny golden flecks. This is because the blue mineral lazurite is mixed with other minerals, including calcite and iron pyrite, also known as fool's gold. This variation can make lapis lazuli particularly attractive when it's used as a polished gemstone, but means it can't simply be crushed to a powder to make a good blue pigment. This would result in a greyish blue powder without the intense colour we see in the bluest areas of the stone. The crushed lapis lazuli mineral must be further processed. Traditionally, this was done by mixing it with resin and wax to make a mass with a dough-like consistency. This mass would be kneaded in an alkaline solution made from wood ash, during which the blue pigment leaches out into the liquid and then settles out. The process of kneading and collecting pigment would be repeated many times with the first washings yielding the best quality pigment and then the later steps giving increasingly greyer and paler material. So how has ultramarine been used in the Wilton diptych? Since the best quality ultramarine pigment was very expensive, artists use it for important features in paintings. It's often seen in the clothes worn by Christ and his mother, the Virgin Mary, as we see here in the Wilton diptych. This small portable diptych dates from the late 14th century it was made by an unknown artist working in England or France. It was created for Richard II, who was King of England from 1377 to 1399, and was likely intended for his own use for private prayer. The inner panels show King Richard on the left, being presented to the Virgin Mary and Christ Child on the right. Natural ultramarine is used for the Virgin Mary's clothes and the clothes of all the surrounding angels. It is mixed with a little lead-white pigment to model the lighter parts of the drapery and is contrasted with the rich gold used for the Christ child's robe, halos and background. Colleagues working in the scientific and conservation departments have been able to look closely at the picture to really see how the pigment was used. We can see the large blue particles of natural ultramarine on the surface of the painting if we examine it under the microscope, indicating that this is a really high quality pigment. This is a detail from one of the angel's curls over a blue robe on the right hand panel. The robes of St Edmund on the left-hand panel also uses this high-quality ultramarine in a scraffito pattern over gold with punched decoration. A tiny paint sample was taken from a blue and gold area of the damaged shield on the back of the panel. This shows the really large particles of strongly coloured ultramarine, even in this area where the paint is partly covered with gold leaf. Our examination shows the high quality of the pigment used and its colour remains vibrant after more than 600 years. Natural ultramarine was used as a pigment over many centuries. It is found in many other paintings at the National Gallery, but it remained a rare and precious colour until the 19th century. The Umbrellas also uses ultramarine, but Pierre-Auguste Renoir wasn't a king, or painting for one, so how did he get hold of this pigment? In more recent times, ultramarine has gone from being one of the most expensive pigments to being one of the cheapest. How was synthetic ultramarine discovered? The development of chemistry as a science over the later years of the 18th century led to the eventual discovery of the chemical composition of ultramarine in 1806 
as a sulphur-containing sodium aluminosilicate. A competition was launched in 1824, offering a prize to the person who could make ultramarine artificially. This was not an easy task, and several similar earlier prizes had been offered but were never awarded. A method was at last developed in 1826 by French industrial chemist Jean-Baptiste Guimet. He was later awarded the prize, and soon after the pigment became widely available as a relatively inexpensive bright blue. The synthetic version of the pigment is sometimes known as French ultramarine to distinguish it from the mineral product. Synthetic ultramarine is chemically the same as the natural ultramarine pigment, but has much smaller and more uniform particles in contrast to the coarse particles found in the top grades of natural ultramarine. Synthetic ultramarine quickly became part of the palette of colours available to artists. It is used extensively in Renoir's The Umbrellas. Renoir worked on this painting in two distinct phases, first using another blue pigment, cobalt blue, to paint the four figures towards the right-hand side in around 1881. In the second phase, the woman at the left side and the umbrellas were added using synthetic ultramarine in around 1885 to 6. Both of these blue pigments were available over this whole period, so it's not clear why Renoir used a different blue in the two stages. They are slightly different shades of blue, so may have been chosen to give a different colour effect. We can also see that fashions have moved on over this period. The plainer style of dress of the woman at the left would have been fashionable in the later period compared to the frillier style of the earlier dresses. Although a lot of synthetic ultramarine has been used, the blues do not appear nearly as bright as those we saw in the Wilton diptych. This is because the synthetic ultramarine has been mixed with other colours, mainly with red, yellow and white pigments, rather than being reserved for select areas in a way that emphasises its pure colour. This is quite a different way to use the pigment that reflects the fact that it's no longer such a highly prized material. Paint cross sections taken from the dress of the woman at the left hand side here include relatively small particles of synthetic ultramarine mixed with other pigments to give the different blue, grey and purplish shades. Synthetic ultramarine is used in many other 19th century paintings. It is the main blue pigment used in Cezanne's hillside in Provence. It is mixed with lead white for the sky and is also used in the deep blue shadows of the rocks mixed with a little black. You can also find synthetic ultramarine in darker blue areas of Monet's irises. So where else will you see synthetic ultramarine? By the 1850s it was even being used in laundry bluing, a blue colourant added to laundry to enhance whiteness, showing how cheap it had become. It is still widely used today to colour paints and plastics. Far from the exclusive origins of this colour, it is now found in objects such as plastic water bottles, as well as in other everyday items. 